Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6, verse 1. And Solomon and I, we always preach and teach from the ESV, the English Standard Version. So I'm going to read this, pray, and Sola will come up. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that all these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii. Now, a denarii was a day's wage. And so 200 denarii, you work, you know, you work about 200 days a year, unless you work from home, and then you work like 100 days a year. No, you work 200 days a year, and a denarii was a day's wage, and so this is the equivalent between, he's saying, Lord, even if we have between 50 to whatever you make, like 150, this is an entire year's salary, or even if even somebody's entire year's salary wouldn't be enough to cover this. He says, not even enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's Peter brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they'd eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of the Lord. Amen, everybody? All right, let me pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we love Solomon so much, Lord. We pray you'd fill him with your Holy Spirit and give him that second service filling of the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. Help him preach prophetically. And Lord, give us ears to hear, God. Give us eyes to see. Speak to us, Jesus. We wanna hear your voice. Bless this time now, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give Solo a big warm welcome as he comes out to share with us this morning. Come on. I keep forgetting to give Solo the pack. That's, our, our transitions aren't that great. I mean. All right, we have a handoff. Very good. <laughs> Amen. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon at this point. Um, who is enjoying the wonderful June weather? Anyone? Yes? Yes. That's right. When we can be uh, happy about the... New York is different when the sun is out, right? It's a different place, and this, people come to live here just for that one or two months when the sun is out and we're not sweating our brains off. But here we are in John chapter 6, and here at Movement, one of the ways that we teach is expository teaching. And with expository teaching, the idea is to draw out from the passage what is there, rather than to read into it what we would like it to say. And so in drawing out from the scripture, it's good to ask the five W's. Who knows what the five W's are? Who, what, where, why, and when. Amen? And sometimes how. <laughs> but so we'll, we'll look at those things in this passage. And so the who. We have Jesus and his disciples and many other people who were following Jesus because of the signs that he was doing, because of the sick people that he was healing. And where were they? They were at the Sea of Galilee, also known as Tiberias. And when was this? This was not too long after Jesus had healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, which Pastor Mike taught us to, through not too long ago. And it was springtime. It was the Passover was coming at hand. And what is happening? Well, the disciples have returned from being sent out two by two. They've been teaching and they've been healing people. And they've come back and they're excitedly telling Jesus about all that they had seen and done. 
Now, it was so busy that they didn't even have a chance to eat yet. And so Jesus says, all right, guys, uh, you haven't eaten, you haven't rested. Come on, let's go somewhere desolate where no one is, and let's get you guys something to eat, and let's get you guys some rest. And isn't life like that sometimes? You're so busy, you don't even have time to eat. Has anyone experienced a day like that, some time like that? You're ministering, or you're just living life, you're getting laundry done, you're cleaning the house. I don't know how families do it, y'all. It's just me, and I have trouble taking care of myself. So I don't know. God bless you all that got kids and other people you're taking care of. Y'all are amazing. But life can get busy, and you need rest and food, and it's hard to get. And this is the situation that the disciples are in. And this crowd, they're kind of relentless. So some of the people in the crowd, they saw where Jesus was going to. And that's kind of crazy. There's always people who know your schedule before you do. Just know that. I've got people in my neighborhood. They know me, and I have no idea who they are. You know, because I ride a bike and they're like, oh, you're the guy with the bike, right? Where's your bike? I'm like, how do I don't know? Who are you? And so you've got some people here. They're like that. They're watching Jesus's every move and they actually figure out where he's going to before he gets there. And so they run ahead and they're there when the disciples get there. So just imagine you've had a full day busy day, you're serving, you're ministering, you're working, whatever you're doing, you go someplace where you don't think anyone's going to be, and the very people you've just come away from are right there, and they're ready for more. And so this is the situation that the disciples find themselves in, and Jesus, he looks out on the crowd, and he has compassion for them. He is a shepherd, and he wants to give them what they need. And so... He begins to teach them for a long time. The day gets long. He's also healing the sick. And now they're at the end of the day. And at this point, the disciples say, all right, Jesus, it's cool. There's no food here. There's no place to stay. Send them into town so they can get some food and eat and let them be on their merry way. (laughs) And Jesus, he then performs a miracle and he feeds all of them. Now, there were 5,000 men, and we know from the account in Matthew, that didn't count the women and and children. So some scholars say there were between 15,000 and 20,000 people who actually ate from this amount. Isn't that amazing? That's just insane. Is anyone here in catering at all? Anyone? Catering? You feeding people at all? No one. Has anyone here cooked for a, a large number of people at all? Anything? Five people. Who here has cooked for themselves? Anyone here (laughs) cooked for themselves? All right. (laughs) Amen. 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 Is it just me? Amen. Amen, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Is it just me? Or is at the end of all that cooking, you're just like, what did I do this for? (laughs) I I mean, it has nothing to do with the message. But when I I cook, y'all... Like, I just finished eating, but now I got to wash dishes and clean the stove. And I'm looking at this, and I'm like, why did I do this? I'm going to use all the energy I just put in my body just to clean. That's why he got McDonald's. Oh, man, that's why he made McDonald's. Now he's got to figure out a way to make it without the cholesterol. Yes. <laughs> Feeding one to five people is an endeavor. And Jesus here feeds 20,000. The people see the sign and they declare at the end, this is definitely the prophet to come. They intend to take him and make him their king. And so, and to use a colloquialism, he dips out. (laughs) Deuces, I'm out. Now we've got the who, the what, the where, the when, why. Why is all of this happening? Why are we reading this? And so to help us with that, it's important to look at some other things that God has written for us in the book of John. And in John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, the writer says that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples 
which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life. This account is written in John chapter 6 so that we might see and bear witness to the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing that, we may have life in his name. And why was he doing it at that moment? In John chapter 5 and verse 36, we read this, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So Jesus is like, you want to know if I'm the Christ, the Son of God? Well, boom, I'm going to feed 20,000 people. How's that for a sign? And he doesn't do it to brag or to boast. The reason why he does it, we read in John chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 and verse 30, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus does this because the Father wants it done. This is the Father's will. He wanted to feed all these people. He had compassion on them and wanted to comfort and minister to them. They had followed him all day. It was late into the day. God the Father wanted to show his glory and do this sign, and he wanted to use this sign once again to show that he indeed had sent Jesus, his son, the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the salvation of Israel and all the world. And he wanted all of this multitude to believe in his son and receive life. This is why this is being done. And so what are some things that we can learn about the Lord from uh, these passages? Well, we learn that the Lord wants to show his glory so that those who bear witness will believe in his son. In verse 14, when the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And they are referring to a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15 where Moses says God will send you another prophet like me and so this sign did exactly what it was supposed to do it caused the people to realize you know what this is that prophet he is him he's the one we're looking for the one we're waiting for This is an historical account, and it's been written down also so that those of us who read it would also believe in his son. This miracle was done for them, and it was written down for us. And I would say that God still wants to show his glory in and through the lives of those of us who've received him, those of us who believe in him, And that those of us who would live out the truths that we glean from these scriptures, that through our lives, God wants to show his glory. Amen? And he wants to draw other people to believe in his son Jesus through the glory that he shows through our lives. Amen? Listen, God is in the business of showing his glory. He's not a show-off. He has a reason for doing it. He wants us to come to him. He wants others to come to him. And so what does he do? He shows himself. He shows himself through us. And if we would live our lives for his glory, he would show it. And we can do this. We can live our lives to the glory of God by doing exactly what Jesus did. By doing what the Father is doing, by saying what he is saying. And how will we know what the Father is doing? How will we know what he is saying? We have to inquire. We have to ask him, Lord, what are you doing? 
What is it that you want to say? We can't just presume to know exactly what he's doing and exactly what he's saying. I was saying in the last service, you know, movement is no longer the same church that it was before the pandemic. Amen? Amen. Is anyone here before the pandemic with us when we were in the flat on the other side? A couple of y'all. That, that was a different time, wasn't it? Yes. It was a different church. We were actually a small church. We're not a small church anymore because we have two services. I attend both, and I still don't know everybody who comes here. You know, change is not easy. Moving, graduating, getting a new job, dating somebody new, <laughs> getting out of a dating relationship. Change is not easy, and it can be very difficult to navigate. And sometimes we find ourselves saying, what is going on? And when we find ourselves in that place, we need to ask God, what are you doing? What is it that you're saying? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Some of, it's so easy to trip out and flip out and lose our minds, but what we need to do is say, God, what are you doing? What do you want to do in this moment? And we need to listen to him and ask him, Lord. Ask the Lord, amen? Another thing we see is that the Lord is counting on his own supply, not yours, not mine. Pastor Mike told us it, that Philip was saying, not even 200 denarii, nearly a year's worth of service would be enough to give them just a little. I love the New Living Translation. It says, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Could you imagine being in a situation, you're with God, you're with the Lord, and he's like, bruh, all these people need to eat. Um, what are we going to do? And you're there, you're like, I don't know, Lord. Like, you got the denarii? I ain't got the denarii for that. Okay? I thought I had denarii, but apparently not. They would have never been able to meet that need. And the Lord was not expecting them to. He already knew what he wanted to do. Amen? I think it's reasonable to say when the Lord brings us to a place and he calls us to do something, he already knows what he wants to do. And he's not asking us to work up the supply. He's asking us to bring the need to him. See, me, my solution to this, I would have said, okay, I got it, Lord. I know what the lesson is. The lesson is to walk around with 200 extra denarii just in case, because you never know when you're going to need extra denarii. Amen? That's my solution. And we can work like that sometimes, where we have to have the supply. We just need to have it on hand just in case. I'm that kind of a guy. It's like I see something didn't work out, we needed this, and so now I got a thousand of those things just lying around just in case, amen? Some of us are like that with the plastic bags in the drawer, right? <laughs> the ketchup packets, you know? It's like, why we got a whole bag, a Ziploc bag, an extra large one full of ketchup? Like, we ain't never gonna need all that ketchup. Or, or the napkins, right? You know, you get to everybody, you go to Mendy's, you go to McDonald's, and you grab that big stack of napkins, and then you find them in your bag six months later, like, why did I grab these? And that's us sometimes. We operate this way. But the Lord owns everything. The whole earth is the Lord's, everything in it. All the people belong to him, amen? He has all the supply that he needs and what he's looking for is to, uh, for us to go to him and say, Lord, you've called us to this work. Supply for it. Amen? And then once we've turned to him, we need to do, as the catchphrase says, let him cook. Watch him work. Amen? And the Lord did a lot of cooking this day. I mean, he cooked up fish and bread for 20,000 people, okay? So if the Lord can't cook, nobody can. Amen? He has all the resources and all the supply for anything he calls you and I to. Amen? Amen. Another thing we see, the Lord is looking to do far more exceedingly 
than anything we can imagine. It seems to me the Lord wants to do things that are far outside of our league. The disciples wanted to send them away. After all, Jesus had taught them all afternoon. He healed the sick. Ministry was over. And isn't that true of us many times? We've done what was our duty. The work is done. And we're like, all right, you people need to go because I need to rest my flesh now. All right? And yet Jesus was just getting started. These guys could never have imagined what Jesus and the Father had in mind. I don't think they wanted to imagine what Jesus and the Father had in mind. And maybe just when we've reached the end of all we've got, the Lord is ready to perform a miracle. Just beyond this moment, this moment of annoyance, where the disciples are like, it's enough, Lord. I mean, it's been all day. It was yesterday. We came here to rest. Send them on their way. Just beyond that moment is the miracle. I see it all the time here. The worship service is over. Church is dismissed. And the Lord is cooking. There are people They're looking for prayer. There are people, they're looking to get healed. There are people who need to be ministered to. And God is just cooking and working, cooking and working. Some people, they stick around. They wasn't even planning to get a word, and a word is spoken over their life. And something happens in that moment, you know? And it doesn't have to be during the 30-minute worship set or the 20-minute teaching. It could be getting coffee over there. It could be getting a snack. And the Lord decides to heal somebody. It could be sitting in the lounge. What's up to all the people in the lounge? Everybody say what's up to the people in the lounge. You know you can sit there during service. And God could do a healing right then and there. God has made all of his people prophets and priests. All of his people can minister. It could be when we leave here that the Lord decides to do something. It could be when you're scooping the poop of your beloved... uh, pet, animal, child, or whatever you want to call them, and you get into conversation with a neighbor that the Lord decides to do a miracle. It could be during a delay in your flight that causes you to miss your connection, and God decides that he wants to do a miracle in that moment. And isn't that what we're here for anyway, for the Lord to draw people to himself, amen, for us to draw closer. And if we want him to do that, we have to take off the restrictions. We have to take off the expectations that he's going to do it when we want it and how we think it's going to happen, amen. You know, this really challenged me. I mean, 20,000 people after all. Nobody was planning for this. But the Father was, and he did a miracle. We have to ask the Lord to remove the fear of surrendering our lives to him. Maybe the Lord is is calling you to do something impossible. Maybe the Lord just wants your life. He says he who would save his life would lose it, but those who lose their life for his sake, they will find it in this life. It can be a scary thing. Perhaps you're thinking, if I really surrender to the Lord, I don't know what he's going to do. Or I don't know what I'm going to miss out on. Or I don't know where he's going to take me. And the Lord would say, listen, give it all up, surrender it to me, and let me take you for this ride. Let me show you what I can do. And this is what we all need to do. We need to partner with the Lord so that he can do with our lives way more than anything we could ever expect. Amen? I want to say another thing. It's not up there, but the Lord wants to show his compassion to everyone. Some of these people, they had followed him for their own purposes. They just saw the healings and the miracles, and God fed them anyway. He blessed them anyway. He revealed his glory to them anyway. He was hospitable to them. You know, 
Don't hold back blessing from the people who may seem undeserving in our lives. And I don't mean we have to accept abuse. That's not what I'm talking about. But there are people in our lives who don't deserve our blessing. Or we just want them to leave. They're annoying. They're an interruption to us. And the Lord is saying, I want you to bless them. Now, you're going to have to talk with the Lord about what that blessing should look like. I'm not saying we need to give them everything, but I'm just saying the Lord may want us to bless them, maybe pray for them. And we can start there. We can pray for them in our prayer closet. Amen? And finally, uh, the Lord, he fought to stay on plan and not get sidetracked. At the end of this, they wanted to take him by force and make him king. And so he decides that he's going to go off into a mountain, into a desolate place, and spend time alone with the Father. When the Lord works, it's powerful. It is amazing to see God work. And sometimes when people see it, they'll look to you and say, wow, man, that was, that was amazing. You know, you should really fill in the blank. You should really do this. You should really do that. And the only way that we'll know if it's from the Lord or if it's a distraction is to take it to him and to say, Lord, what about this opportunity? What do you want me to do here? And so seeing all these things about the Lord, what should we do? Well, some things that we can do is get in there. Get involved. Become a disciple of Christ. Be his student. To be a disciple of Christ is more than just to believe in him. It is to take him on as our master, as our teacher. It's to say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to learn from you. Here he's teaching his disciples. He has all the supply. There's so much that he wants to do. And you know what? They needed to learn the lesson twice because he feeds another 4,000 later on. And they still are like a little, I don't know what's happening here. And so we can get in there and get involved. These guys, these disciples, they see this because they're already involved with the Lord. They're already serving with him. He had just been sent out. So we need to get in there. And then just bring what you have. This little boy, he brought his five loaves and his two fish. He wasn't really probably expecting a whole miracle to be done. Or maybe he was. Maybe he was like, today's the day the Lord going to call on me. I got my five fish, my five loaves, and my two fish. I'm just waiting for it, Lord. You know, it's like double dutch. How many people know about double dutch? You know, when you're going into that double dutch, you're like this. You know? (laughs) And some of us, the double dutch is behind us, and we're just chatting away, and we're just talking. And the Lord wants to use us, and we're not ready And the Lord is saying, hey, come on. Are you ready? And we're like, but I'm not ready yet, Lord. He's like, well, bring what you got. Bring who you are. Maybe maybe you're a little bit cynical. Maybe you're like Philip and you're a little sarcastic in your cynicism. You know what? Bring your cynical self. Maybe you're God's gift to the world. You know, you're the smartest person in the room. You're the best looking person. You've got more money. You got the denarii. You know? Well, you know what? Bring that. Maybe you're very talented. You can do a thousand different things. You know what? Bring that. Maybe you're an extrovert or an introvert or a bivert, whatever vert you are. Bring it. There's only one condition. All of who you are, all of what you have, as we bring it, we have to lay it down at the feet of Jesus. We have to say, Lord, this is who I am. This is all I have. It's yours. Do with this what you want. Tell me what you want to do with this, with all of who I am. And, you know, none of us are the same. You are not anyone else. Don't try to be anyone else. And don't shy away from the Lord because you're not like them. The Lord made you. He knows how he made you. And he wants you to bring you to himself. Amen? 
And as we bring what we have, serve him. And then surrender every expectation. Don't box him in. And then let him cook. Watch him work. And who knows what miracle the Lord will perform. Who knows how many he will draw to himself. Is the Lord calling you to something impossible? Are you looking at something in front of you and you have no idea how it's going to get done? You know what? Come up and get prayer. Maybe you are ready. You are ready. You're there. You're at the double dutch rope and you're like, come on, Lord, I'm ready. Come up and get prayer so that you can be equipped for what the Lord wants to do in your life. Maybe what we're asking for is just a little bit too small. I mean, I want my father saved. Right? But God wants all of New York City. God wants every person in the nursing home where my father is saved. God wants all the Panamanians in Panama where my father was born. He wants them all saved. Amen? Amen. So maybe I'm asking for a little too little. And maybe you are too. Hey, Come up, get prayer, and let the Lord tell you what he's doing. Amen? Lord, you are the Lord. And God, tell us what you want. Show us what you're doing so that we can come alongside of you and partner with you, God. Forgive us, Lord, where we've boxed you in, where we've limited you to our own expectations, God. Thank you for the writings in scripture that teach us, that show us what is possible, God. Father, do the impossible here in New York City. Do the impossible in our own hearts. Do the impossible in our families, Lord. Draw all people to yourself, God. Have your way in us, God. We thank you. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's hear from Pastor Solomon.